I'm now excited to uh, welcome Stan back uh, to our uh, to help close us out as we near um, the end of our convening today. And he's really, you know, going to help us around next steps. As you know, we've heard a lot of information today, and this is really an opportunity to how we can make some meaning and, and put it in the context of our work. So I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Stan. Hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you for, again, giving me a little bit more time. And it's perfect to have this conversation on the heel of Ashley uh, and the work that the Oversight and Accountability Commission has done. And I just also want to give a special nod uh, to Ashley. She has been tremendous in the creation of that strategic plan and really putting suicide prevention efforts at the forefront. And I think the work that she and, and the team that she works with have done is really going to set the stage for the next decades of, of work that we're doing. So compliments to them and the work they've done. Um, with that, there were just a few questions from the previous session uh, that I wanted to take just a few mo moments before we jump in and address. Um, in the meantime, I'm actually gonna move off this slide so you're seeing enough of my face as it is. Um, if I can, there we go. Oh, wait, I wanna go one back. Oh, never mind. It's not there anymore. This is fine. You're just getting two versions of me right now. Uh, so with that, um, one of the questions was uh, just the idea that postvention is prevention um, based on contagion, based on uh, what, you know, increased risk. When we have an effective postvention response, it can help us to identify youth that may be at increased risk and also set the table for future prevention efforts. Um, a lot of you were asking about that poem that I wrote in high school and I did some digging. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't find it. I will try to find it. Um, again, your idea of what that poem might be is probably more eloquent than what that poem actually is. I was 17 years old or 16 when I wrote it. Um, and there's also some connection about, uh, you know, violence, this idea of violence and suicide, um, or, you know, should we respond to suicides the same way we would respond to murder suicides? And there's a lot of consistency that is there, but also some nuances. And we're starting to do some more work in the field at how to respond to those. Um, but also there was a question about does uh, indicators of violence oftentimes associated with suicide. And what I would say is there's this kind of when we do like for the for example in a school setting uh, we don't a, a suicide risk screening should be separate from a threat assessment. Uh, we don't want to internalize or connect the two of those. Um, most individuals who have thoughts of suicide are not having thoughts of harming others. However, the inverse of that is that most who have thoughts of harming others ha also have thoughts of suicide. So I guess in terms of violence towards others, um, I've always stood by the idea that if we do a better job at identifying suicide risk early before that can have an opportunity to tra transform to thoughts of violence towards others, uh, we can reduce both. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the presentation. Uh, if there's any other questions, you're welcome to email me directly afterwards. They can drop the uh, my contact information. Uh, the support team is also dropping some of those resources that I mentioned earlier from the Trevor Hotline, National Lifeline, Crisis Text Line into the chat right now so that you can have those. And again, they'll be followed up with in the email as well. Uh, but in the time that we have, I want to go ahead and move on. So the the theme of this presentation is the hero in each of us finding your role in suicide prevention. And to kick us off, I wanted to share this quote that I, I was reading this wonderful book uh, just recently. It's called Care of the Soul. And I know it's a little blurry for you, uh, so I'll read it. Um, but it, it talks about these, uh, you know, kind of this transition that we need to make and how we deal with therapy. Uh, we often look at therapy or mental health support as trying to cure the individual. And it's not about curing anything. It's about caring for that individual. But this quote really stood out to me as I was reading it in that I really thought it spoke to this idea that we have this stigma around suicide. But it reads, the Greeks told the story of the Minotaur, the bullheaded flesh-eating man who lived in the center of the labyrinth. He was a threatening beast, and yet his name was Asterion, which means star. I often think of this paradox as I sit with someone with tears in her eyes, searching for some way to deal with a death, a divorce, or a depression. It is a beast, a thing that stirs in the core of her being, but it is also the star of her innermost nature. We have to care for the suffering with extreme reverence so that in our fear and anger at the beast, we do not overlook the star. 
And I think this applies to all the work that we do around suicide prevention and that we can't just try to attack this idea of suicide. The, the intricacies that led that person to have these thoughts, the pain that they created is also a source of their empathy, empathy and their caring for themselves and for others. And I just thought, um, again, the book is called Care of the Soul by Thomas More, uh, but I thought it really applied to the work that we're trying to do in suicide prevention and what I talked about earlier. It's not about convincing someone not to die. It's about helping them find their reasons for living. And I wanted to share it with you as we kick off today. So with that, we've kind of referenced throughout the day. And one of the questions I most frequently get is what are the causes of suicide? What causes suicide? And we've heard about some of the situations that increase risk of suicide. But I really push back about this idea that there are any quote unquote causes of suicide. And to use this metaphor of the board game Jenga, hopefully you're familiar with this game. It's a board game where you stack blocks on top of each other. And one by one, you take turns pulling blocks out. And eventually somebody will pull out a block that will cause the entire tower to fall. With that, if we use this as a metaphor for suicide, and you know, in the game, when someone pulls out that block they, they, that causes the tower to fall, they lose because that one block caused the tower to fall. And as a metaphor for suicide, we often look at that one last block, that straw that broke the camel's back, whether it's a breakup, whether it's getting electronics taken away, whether it's a, a fight with a friend or a family member, and we say, well, that's what caused suicide. And as Dr. Goldman referred to earlier, it is a complex scenario, and there's rarely, if ever, a single cause for suicide. Now, as this relates to prevention, we can't necessarily prevent bad things from happening in people's lives. We can't pain, stop pain from, from being inflicted on someone. What we can, however, do is reinforce that structure that every time a block is at, pulled out, go around that foundation and, and provide more supports and more protective factors and more coping skills and more help seeking so that that next block doesn't have quite that monumental impact on that individual's life. And so I wanted us to just keep this also in mind as we're moving forward over the next few minutes. Now, earlier, we also heard about some of the correct terminology, so I won't spend too much time here, but I will provide just some context for what this means. And I'm actually going to ask you to participate in the chat on this portion. The reason why we don't uh, specifically uh, looking at the term committed suicide is that the term committed is often associated with negative, negative issues or negative items. Uh, for example, and this is where the participation comes in, uh, fill in the blank here. What are some of the actions that we commit? We commit, fill in the blank, and go ahead and type it in the chat. What are some of the actions that we commit? Sin, murder, crime, adultery, treason, robbery, uh, larceny, a lot of negative things, fraud, felonies, a lot of negative things. So we can go ahead and, and pause there. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to one of you who actually put in a positive thing, which is marriage. We commit to marriages. We commit, in reality, we commit to a lot of positive things. We commit to our friendships. You commit to your jobs, your friends, your family, our relationships. But that term committed often brings with it a negative crime um, connotation associated with crime or sin. And so we want to reframe that and again use the terms died by suicide, died of suicide, took their own life. And really the, the clearest way to do this is to either use the term death by suicide or attempted suicide. It's very clear what those two actions resulted in without incorporating any bias, stigma, or shame. Now also don't beat yourself up. You're going to correct yourself a thousand times before you get it right. And the reason why this matters goes back to this idea of messaging. And I thought it was really pertinent to incorporate a conversation about messaging today because it is absolutely something that every one of us can do, regardless of what our professional roles are, regardless of what our personal roles may bring us into when it comes to suicide. And it comes down to messaging and the impacts that messaging can have. And some messaging can have negative impacts and it can expose vulnerable in individuals who are already having thoughts of suicide to messages that can actually increase their risk. On the other side of that, is, is the positive. When we have positive messages that promote prevention, that empower people to understand that they have a role to play in suicide prevention, we will see more help seeking, we will see more identification, referral, and conversations uh, moving towards prevention. And the negative impacts are known as the Vircher effect, based on a book called The Sorrows of Young Vircher. That was one of the first historical incidences of, of suicide contagion. And we spent a lot, a lot of time in my career 
uh, or over the last few years talking about the Bircher effect and talking to media and saying, don't do this or somebody might die. But as you know, you will always get more with a carrot than a stick. And so over the last few years, instead, we have been focused on what's termed the Papagino effect. It's named after a character in the magic flute. And what it is, is it's saying, if we do this, if we have positive messages, we can actually save somebody's lives. So instead of this mentality of don't do this or people might die, we're focusing on please do this and we can save people's lives. And so those are the two components. The National Action Alliance, which is behind the national strategy, has created a website, suicidepreventionmessaging.org. And they've highlighted four key elements. That first you want your message to be tied to a strategy. You wanna filter it through a lens of safety. We wanna provide a positive narrative. A lot of the people that we speak to uh, that have lived experience who are kind of ambassadors for suicide prevention and messaging are, you know, for example, my story of loss. But I hope that what you saw from my story of loss is that I brought it back to a story of hope and a story of resiliency and prevention and things that we can all do. And that also there are guidelines through Know the Signs. We've created a number of resources to help guide you and give you feedback and, and you know, instruction on how to create a positive message. So a few of the key elements you want to focus on, no matter what we're talking about, prevention, aftermath, postvention, whatever it is, we always want to provide a resource. We need to always be aware that the people that we're reaching out to may very likely have be having thoughts of suicide themselves, may be lost survivors, and may need to talk to somebody. So connecting them to a resource. Again, we want to focus on those stories of prevention. We see far too few stories of folks who have had thoughts of suicide talking about what helped them make a different decision, what helped them find their reasons for living. We want to give people specific actions. We spent a lot of time in the first few years when I was working in this field in the early 2000s trying to convince people of the problem of suicide. We were screaming from the rooftop saying, there is a fire over here and to please bring water. And what we've come to understand is that most people now understand that suicide is an issue but they don't know what they can do. They don't understand that they can do something. And so for those few precious moments, we have their attention. Instead of convincing them of a problem they already know, let's give them the skills and the knowledge to know what to do. We also want to avoid statements that make suicides uh, normalize or uh, seem common. We don't want to use terms like skyrocketing or epidemic. The reality is, yes, a lot of people we, it will be impacted by suicidal thoughts, but if we inadvertently normalize suicide, we might remove a protective factor for somebody who's ambivalent or debating whether to live or die. And going back to the previous conversation, we want to avoid oversimplifying the causes that if you're bullied, it's normal to think about suicide. It's not abnormal, but most kids who get bullied will not attempt suicide. Most people who go through a breakup or divorce will not think about suicide. And so we want to show the complexity. And again, you can go to suicidepreventionmessaging.org. For any of you who have a communications officer or a PIO, I would encourage you to share this resource, reportingonsuicide.org. Also sharing it with any reporters that might want to be doing a story about suicide prevention, just making them aware of those. Uh, with that, oh, sorry, too many buttons, I apologize. Uh, we talked about this earlier and I walked you through each of these steps. And now that you've gotten a lot of content throughout the day, I'm hoping that this kind of, this is a very simplified list, obviously, uh, but it kind of puts it into some key buckets of what we can do. And I hope that you will use this. Again, we do know what can be effective. And a lot of people will say, well, we're doing more suicide prevention work and there's more funding for suicide prevention than there ever has been. And yet the numbers continue to e increase year over year. Well, actually we're starting to see some instances where suicide is leveling off or maybe some hope that numbers are decreasing. And also there is not one community in our country that is comprehensively on every, you know, firing on every cylinder when it comes to suicide prevention. They may have great supports in the schools, but in the community they're lacking. Or in the professional workplace, they're doing a great work, but uh, lacking in other areas. So we have yet to really come together as communities and really be completely comprehensive in our efforts. So we still have a lot of hope for how suicide prevention activities can come into place. And as I mentioned, the statewide strategy gets us closer to that goal. I mentioned the California Department of Education's model policy for uh, youth suicide prevention. And here again are some of those elements that I discussed earlier. Um, I would encourage you to look at that model policy and an updated version will be coming out soon. But again, the key elements for that, we need to make sure all staff, that includes volunteers, coaches, 
um, making sure that we're training our staff and how to do a proper risk assessment and that we're responding to youth in the least restrictive settings. We need to make sure that referral process is clear to everyone. It's as smooth as possible. Taking time to vet those community resources ahead of time. So again, you don't look at uh, you know the fire escapes when a fire is happening. You should look at them ahead. We, you know, we do fire drills every day or every year in our schools. Um, we know what to do in those emergencies. We need to know what to do in, in mental health crises as well. Uh, we need to look at how are we supporting youth upon reentry. We need to look at our high risk groups. There's a few that are identified in the Assembly Bill 2246 and 1767, including uh, youth in out of home settings or foster youth, youth with mental health or substance abuse issues, uh, LGBTQ youth, and youth bereaved by suicide. But there are other groups of youth, as discussed earlier, that can be at um, and I don't like the term high risk per se. What I prefer to say is that groups are disproportionately affected by suicide. Uh, we talked about um, American Indian, Native American youth being one of the, seeing the highest rates, but just because someone is a Native American or I, American Indian does not mean that just because of one aspect of who they are, that they, they will automatically be at increased risk for suicide. Um, we need to make sure we're engaging our youth and we need to make sure that we're prepared to, to follow up after a suicide. Again, here's some of those resources. Uh, suicide is preventable. The, the Spanish language companion, El Suicidio es Prevenible, uh, where you can refer people for information on warning signs, how to have a conversation. Uh, it's not you know, as comprehensive as a full training, but it at least is a step in the right direction. And again, through Know the Signs, we'd be happy to send you a code to embed this on your district or your school's website. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. You have a best practice marketing campaign that's safe and effective messaging to spread information about suicide awareness. All right, so now I'm gonna ask for your participation here. And this, if we were in person, I would have you turn to your left or turn to your right uh, and talk to your partner. Uh, that is obviously uh, illegal for us to do right now. So in this virtual setting, what I'm gonna ask you to do is just take a moment and say these questions out loud. Because the role that each of us can play in suicide prevention is not being afraid to say the word. And I want to take you through these very kind of key important questions. Number one is, are you thinking about suicide? Whether you're in a professional setting, a personal setting, not being afraid to say the S word and talking directly and asking, are you thinking about suicide? We want to avoid asking the question, are you thinking about hurting yourself or harming yourself, which a lot of people think is safer but it's not asking the question. We are trying to be very clear. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Or are you thinking about suicide? The reason why we don't wanna use, are you thinking about hurting yourself or harming yourself? Earlier, we talked about this idea that suicide often happens when there's overwhelming pain and people incorrectly perceive that suicide will be an end to their pain. And so if you ask them if they are thinking about hurting their, their, themselves, they may not understand the question the way you intended it. So again, question one, are you thinking about suicide? Two, do you have a plan? What is really the indicator between low risk or passive risk and active risk is whether there is intent and a plan. There's, you know, we can go more, but I'm trying to keep it kind of very simple buckets here. So are you thinking about suicide? Do you have a plan? Now, one of the fears about asking about a plan is, well, what if they say no? Might they realize that, well, I should have a plan, so I'm gonna start thinking about a plan. And that's not what happens. What we're trying to figure out is how far down the slope this individual has slipped and what level of risk. And when we start to see planning and behaviors, that is where we start to see the transition from low or passive risk into high or act, um, active risk. Now, once we know that some, someone is thinking about suicide, once we know whether or not someone has a plan or has conducted any behaviors related to suicide, in my opinion, at that point, at a, at a basic level, that's all I need to know about suicide because suicide is not their problem. The pain that is leading to those thoughts of suicide is the problem. And so that's that third question there. And it kind of represents a lot of questions, but let's do this. Let's pretend I am your five-year-old nephew. And if you could participate in the chat, that would be great. If I came up to you and I said, I have a stomach ache, what kind of questions would you ask me about the pain in my stomach? So this is the interactive part. Go ahead, please type in the chat. I'm your nephew. I tell you I got a tummy ache. What questions would you want to know about the pain in my stomach? So when did it start? What did you eat? What might be causing it? Scale of one to 10, uh, how bad does it hurt? 
Uh, some of you parents out there are asking, did you go potty? So I would translate that to our purposes. Is there anything that you've done that might help alleviate that pain? Uh, OPQRST, I'm an EMT. So that, that stands for onset provocation, uh, quality, radiation, all these questions kind of fall under that OPQRST. So thank you, this is awesome. How long does it hurt? Describe the pain. So with that, let's translate that back to a conversation about emotional pain or suicide. Imagine you come to me and I might respond, I had no idea you were in so much pain. How long have you been experiencing this pain? Scale of one to 10, how bad is it right now? It's at a seven. Okay, well, has it ever been at a 10? Oh, is it a 10 yesterday? Okay, well, what happened between yesterday and today to bring the pain down from a 10 to a seven? Is there anything else that you've tried to do to reduce this pain? How long have you been experiencing this pain? What makes it worse? when you get online or social media or when you get contacted by that person? Okay, well, what makes it better? And what I'm trying to do is provide a framework for us to move beyond just the fear of the word suicide and start to sympathize and empathize and understand what this person is experiencing and what this person is experiencing as pain. And from there, we're not trying to solve the pain. Again, we're not trying to eliminate the pain. We're trying to just sit there in the mud with that individual for a moment and let them talk about that pain. And what we know is that just by sharing our pain, it starts to alleviate it. What we're starting to do now is turn the corner in. Okay, now we can understand the pain. So what can we do to reduce the pain? Or what can we do pre from preventing this pain from be becoming overwhelming in the future? So I know this is kind of strange, but for the next 30 seconds, you're muted so nobody can see or hear you anyways. I want you just to ask these questions alongside me. So we're gonna take a moment. We're just gonna run through them one, two, three. So hopefully you're, you're with me out there. Are you thinking about suicide? Do you have a plan? And when was the last time you thought about suicide? Now I know I made that seem very simple and the, these questions are extremely complex and very complicated. And the more you love somebody, the closer you are to that person, the harder it's gonna to be to ask these questions. But you have to do the heavy lift. Imagine I am someone that is thinking about suicide and I wanna come talk to you about my thoughts of suicide. I'm gonna be scared because I don't know how you're gonna react or you're gonna respond. But if you come to me and you say, hey, Stan, I've been worried about you. I've noticed this, I've seen that. I know you're going through this. I wanna know, are you thinking about suicide? What you've done is all the heavy lifting. Now, all I have to do is say yes or no or break down and cry. And by understanding where my risk is at and what is causing this pain, I will understand that you are a person who I can trust, who is there to hold on to the hope for me until I get to the next space. And again, you do not have to be a mental health professional to ask these questions. You are all experts in people. You've been around people your whole life. And what we know helps to prevent suicide the most is feeling connected. And oftentimes we worry about this causing or planning the idea. There's research to show that's not the case. And what we also worry about is having all the answers. Well, what if, what if I don't know what to do or what to say? And there's a saying that goes, we have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. And in that moment, one of the most powerful things you can do is listen. And I don't know is a perfectly acceptable answer. I don't know, but we're gonna figure this out together. I'm gonna be here by your side. Just letting them know that you're not alone, that you're gonna hold on to that hope for them can be extremely powerful. And I will tell you, I've never had anyone get mad at me for asking them if they're having thoughts of suicide. And in fact, again, like I said earlier, Typically what I see is like, it's like a pressure valve has been released and the shoulders relax and the breathing calms down because now suicide is a thing that we can talk about. Now it's that minotaur in the middle of the labyrinth that we no longer have to be scared of. One of the best steps we can do following a conversation is, as I mentioned earlier, is safety planning. If you're not familiar with safety planning, there's wonderful resources online. Uh, and I also wanted to share with you a few years ago, we created the My3 app and we have now passed along to the, the National Lifeline, but it's a phone app that you can download in, uh, in Android or Google, iPhone for free, and the person can customize their own safety plan. They can email it to their parent. They can email it uh, to their mental health professional. They can email it to themselves, but it's a way for someone to always have access to their safety plan, and there's also a way to bring in your contacts so you can have a conversation with your support network and say, will you be part of my safety network? And with the press of a button, they can call that person. With the press of a button, they can call the lifeline. And again, uh, this is all about teaching people how to swim against the rip current, rather than just hoping there's gonna be a lifeguard there to throw them a life preserver. 
It's a really powerful skill. And it also helps to build in, this, in them this idea that you are stronger than this pain, that hope is greater than pain. We've also talked a little bit about lethal means restriction throughout the day, uh, what we refer to in suicide prevention as means safety. And as Ashley alluded to, as uh, Dr. Goldman re referred to earlier, mean safety is one of the most evidence-based strategies that we have shown uh, to keep people safe, to remove those most lethal means from that person's environment, to help uh, reduce any risk if there is substitution, reduce the lethality of these attempts. Uh, but here's just some of the key elements of why mean safety works. Again, I could spend another two hours talking to you about mean safety, but if you're interested in the topic, please feel free to reach out to me and um, we're gonna be putting out a lot more information over the coming months on mean safety, but it has to be part of the assessment. We have to get school counselors and staff who are working with parents to not be afraid to ask parents. And maybe the question isn't, do you have guns in your home? Maybe the question is, are your firearms secured safely? So that it doesn't come from a place of, of guilt or shame, but just making sure that they're safe, getting them thinking about um, other means. And that's why it's so important to not just ask if they have a plan, but what is their plan? to help narrow that lane of how we can keep that child safe. I also want to share with you really quickly, uh, Laura, if you're back there, I would love to just share one of the directing change films before we close out the day. Is that still a possibility? It looks like it is. So uh, I want to share with you one film from the directing change program. I'll come back, talk to you about how you can get involved, and then we'll close out the day. Esta es la historia de mi amigo Tyler. Durante nuestro primer año de la escuela secundaria, comenzó a alejarse de nuestro grupo de amigos. Después de esto, se volvió al alcohol y las drogas. Traté de mostrar mi preocupación, pero no se había dado cuenta de que solo estaba tratando de ayudar. Bueno, he estado pensando en esto por un tiempo ahora. No puedo seguir así viviendo de esta manera, a menos que algo en mi vida cambie. Así que al fin voy a hacerlo. Voy a buscar ayuda. Así que ha sido dos meses desde que tenía pensamientos suicidas y estoy muy agradecido por Andrea que ayudó a salvar mi vida. Thank you for uh, giving me the space to share the film. So that was from the Directing Change program. You can go and you see at the chat, directingchangeca.org to learn how to participate. It is open to youth in grades six through 12 and youth ages 12 to 24 or 25. Um, and what it is, is it's an evaluated mental health suicide prevention program where youth learn all the things we want them to know, but they do it through creation. And if you think about Bloom's taxonomy at the top, is where we see that creation and that retention of information. So I hope you'll visit Directing Change. We also have uh, literally thousands of films available for you to use. We have lesson plans, uh, other resources. We also, as I mentioned earlier, work with districts in rolling out comprehensive policies. Uh, but please visit the website. Again, it is an evaluated program and it's been really effective with our youth. Uh, this last slide just shows you where to access those resources. And then finally, um, at the top, when you go to Directing Change, you'll see Watch and Use Films, and that's where you have access to literally thousands of youth-created films in a variety of languages, addressing a variety of cultures. And uh, with that, I want to close with, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, today has been a heavy day. Today has been a long day. And I hope you're sitting there feeling more empowered about what you as an individual can do and what you can bring back to your school site or district. And I want to leave you with these words. And again, today's about hope. So hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it is a tree that stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it is a long way from here. Hold on to your life, even if it is easier to let go. Hold on to my hand, even if someday I will be gone away from you. Uh, thank you all so very much for giving me this platform to have a conversation. Uh, Sergio, thank you. You've been a tremendous host today. Um, again, educators of the chosen people, you are more qualified for, to do this than you think you are, and thank you all for your time. Take good care and stay safe.